There was once a boy named Milo who didn't know what to do with himself. Not just sometimes, but always. When he was in school, he longed to be out, and when he was out, he longed to be in. On the way, he thought about coming home, and coming home, he thought about going. Wherever he was, he wished he was somewhere else, and when he got there, he wondered why he bothered. It seems to me that almost everything is a waste of time, he remarked one day as he walked dejectedly home from school. I can't see the point in learning to solve useless problems or subtracting turnips from turnips or knowing where Ethiopia is or how to spell February. And since no one bothered to explain otherwise, he regarded the process of seeking knowledge as the greatest waste of time of all. When I started writing The Phantom Tollbooth, I realized that what I had to do was get Milo to a place where the world is really upside down. Alice goes down a rabbit hole, and the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, they go through the back of the wardrobe. It's something that when you pass through, is very sharp, and you know you're someplace different. And I remembered, because as a child, we drove lots of places, and there was always great anticipation always feeling it was a bit of an adventure when we went through a toll booth. And I started playing with that and playing with the way the word sounds. I love the combination of the two words that seem like they would never belong together. And I said, that's what it has to be, phantom and toll booth. Today we're phantom tollbooth. Today we're very, very honored. The phantom toll booth, which was published 50 years ago, is celebrating, therefore, its golden anniversary, and today we have the author, Norton Juster, and the artist, Jules Spicer. It's a weird dichotomy of people who have absolutely never heard of it. It's not like The Cat in the Hat, which most people have heard of, some have read, some have not. Um, no, you either know it and speak of it as if it were a, a biblical text, um, or you've never heard of it. Oh, sure, absolutely. More absolutely more meaningful. More meaningful than the Bible. <laughs> 50 years is a long time for something to, to uh, hold the imagination of people. Uh, 20 years, that just means it's gone on for a bit. 50 years means parents have given it to kids and kids have given it to their kids, and it's really a classic. Jules and I you know, did another book of, uh, a year or so ago, and we realized it was such fun working together, and Jules suggested this, that we make a little pact, and we, we, we are prepared now to do a new book every 50 years. <laughs> there were once two men. One was an architect who was writing a book that he did not want to write. The other man drew cartoons that were not like anybody else's. The architect was round and cheerful and loved to play with words. The cartoonist was tall and satirical and longed to change the world. But as different as they were, they became great friends. In New York City, in Brooklyn Heights, in a little brownstone where one lived upstairs and one lived down. And before long, they were working on the same book, a new book, one that the architect did want to write. The round architect worked at his desk, and the tall cartoonist worked at his drafting table, and they would run up and down between the two floors, and occasionally they'd meet over pizza and papers and puns. And soon they had made a book. And like the men, the book was funny and clever and strange. And some people said, this would never do. But it seems those people were wrong. For later, 50 years later, they read it to their grandchildren. And Norton is still writing. And Jules is still drawing. And they're still friends. Pine, the moon 
you're so high, you see where you're going with your eyes closed. Wild eyed growl and smoke return every question of the sink. Here we are on a trip down memory lane. I have I don't think I've been in this neighborhood in years. God, there's me when I was 33, walking down the street. My first apartment was on Hick Street, which I had a basement apartment. And then when we moved, it was Jules and this other friend of ours found this old rundown duplex on State Street, which by that time was a block that had not been fixed up at all. It was two big floors and um, not much else. I mean, it was the bathroom was not great, the kitchen was not great. But we, you know, we were young enough to deal with all those problems. And uh, that's where I got started writing the, the Phantom Talbot and Jules did the illustrations. So uh, within a minute or two, we'll be on Court Street and we'll be right over to the restaurant. I don't think I ever made it past the Queen without buying a slice of pizza. It was really that good. Hi. Hello, Joel. How are you? Good. Jules, this is not the Queen, and you're not Jules' wife. No, I'm not. She couldn't make it. So I'm Andy Warhol, who's standing. Oh, boy. Oh, no, get up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. First of all, I can't shake hands. I've got uh, arthritis in my right hand. It hurts. Oh, shake hands. When you're my age, you will understand. Oh, Oh, wicked. You. All right. No pictures. We are in Brooklyn Heights, a Queen restaurant, which is a block away from here. But that building has disappeared, and is now this new place, which is a lot classier than the other one, except for the clientele, of course. You were in classy places when we lived. Yeah. Though were we classy, as I recall. Except in our own eyes. Naughty and I were the... Uh, I did the meals. I never found out what you did. Well, one of us was Harpo and the other was Groucho, and we <laughs> never figured that out either. They're like a couple of Jewish uncles, sort of, your, you know, imaginary Jewish uncles there. They interrupt each other and they talk over each other and they're full of uh, charm. I, was, I had met Jules Pfeiffer over the years because our paths have crossed in New York, and Jules is very much what you would expect Jules Pfeiffer to be. He's such a complete contrast to Norton in every way. It's fantastic that they found each other. Um, because in, in they're physically opposite, they're temperamentally and, and how they function in space is completely opposite and uh, uh, their pace, um, I mean, they were, they were probably one person at one point and then eons ago they were split into two people and that's why they finally got together. He hasn't changed that much. He was on the short side, very straight, and with a totally jovial, an intense jovial presence. You know, there was an insistent humor about him. He had a very New York style where, you know, if you left an opening, you were dead. Jules was tall, he was thin, somewhat ungainly, very bright uh, and funny, and we, took to each other very quickly. We just enjoyed each other's company. And we enjoyed going back and forth with each other and cracking wise. I thought he was terribly funny. He thought apparently that I was funny. We were both smart. And we were both, you know, convinced that we were going places. And how did you start doing illustrations for the television? Well, I think it was just a natural evolution. And then when he started writing it, he would, uh, he was never very good at keeping things to himself, so he'd have to read me. <laughs> the last four lines he wrote. And, and, uh, and somewhere along that line, I started sketching. And I would design characters and play around with them. And, and uh... we began doing things, little things to subvert each other. You know, weather, that weatherman thing which you drew, which is me. You know, the weatherman was Norton. Oh, and it still looks like him, yeah. you know, except the beard is black. But other, Norton still looks exactly yeah. the same. Generally, if you're the author and there's an illustrator, they don't let you talk to each other. Uh, and so you don't have that interplay. It's very rare that an author and an illustrator come with the whole package. Many people who start out doing children's books think 
they also have to come up with the illustrator. I'll write the story and you'll illustrate the book. That's not necessary at all. The publisher has um, a stable of writers or illustrators, depending which way. Uh, so the, it is unusual for an editor, uh, for an artist and a uh, writer to get together and present something. I think the editor wants to feel like they, you know, they got a part in, and sometimes that works well, but sometimes, obviously, this was, this was a match that needed to happen and they, they needed each other. Yeah, and they were not established at all. Mm-hmm. Total, total unknowns. But I had been both working in an architectural office and teaching at Pratt Institute in, in New York. I had no intentions to write a book. If you said to me, uh, you, at some point in your life you're going to write a children's book that becomes very popular and then you're going to be living in a small town in western Massachusetts, I would have told them they were insane. And I was just around that time starting out as the Village Voice and do politics. I looked down on the whole business of children's book art. By the time I got out of the Army, I had become so politicized, so radicalized by the military that my goals had changed completely. I no longer wanted to do innocent work in my work. I wanted to do argumentative work. What put us together as writer and artist is that we essentially see ourselves both socially and, uh, pro- and, and professionally as bad boys. I mean, there, there, there's something of a, um, an outlaw sensibility in the work we do, and simply because it's the way we think. Well, I think creative people, whether they're, <clears throat> whether they're musicians or painters or writers, whatever, write, paint, write music primarily for themselves. And I, that's true of Norton, too. He, I'm convinced, we never talked about this, but I'm convinced he didn't sit down and said, I'm writing a book for children. You know, he is so interested in words and word plays. That's his, his nature. And uh, he had to put this down. I was a very strange child, I guess, because I responded to teachers, through, to parents, in ways that quite often were unexpected or not understandable to them. And so I was left alone primarily, which was wonderful because there I was free to roam around in my own head and be bored. And I just read everything I could get my hands on Quite often, I didn't know what they meant, uh, except the words were so intriguing and so wonderful, the sounds of them, a music, a rhythm, uh, a sense of uh, not so much understanding, but feeling. Norton and I began as fellow tenants on State Street. Norton did the cooking, and we roamed back and forth between the two floors, and that's when Norton wrote the Phantom Tollbooth. Ring the bell. It was just a kind of um, screwball comedy. Okay, let's make a break for it. And what were you doing in that house over on State Street? We were trying to make out with, we were trying to lure women into the house. And all, and we were very bad at luring women into the house, so we... I wasn't, my mother used to drop by occasionally. That's true, that's true. So we had occasional women, and mostly us, complaining about not having women in the house. <laughs> right. And when we did have a woman, she would date one of us, and that never worked out, so she'd go out with the other one. She'd work her way through the system. Well, I mean, this part is true. Norton got a grant from the Ford Foundation to write a book on uh, urban design, I guess. And it, was, er, it was on urban perception. Yeah, and it was $5,000? I can't remember. Something sounds reasonable. I think it was, yeah. it was a lot of money. I mean, that, that, that time, $5,000 yeah. would be the equivalent of $20,000. You know, it was yes. a lot of money. And so the first thing he did was not write the book. Uh, I tried. I worked for several months, yeah. and I'd hold these little lows up to my ass and little three by five cards with notes on them. And I realized this was not a game I was very good at or wanted to play. I just took a break after several months, and I, I was practically exhausted. I went out on a vacation and visited some friends, and this was the summertime out in Fire Island. And uh, I took long walks on the beach. And in order to stop thinking about the book on cities, I had to think about something else. That's the only way you get anything out of your mind, by thinking about something else. And uh, 
So I started thinking, well, maybe I'll do a little story about a kid who didn't like to go to school, didn't have any particular interest in, in learning things for their own sake, and didn't understand why he had to, and um, just didn't like to do things he didn't want to do, which was, of course, me at the time. And um, I started, and I kept going. Chapter one. Milo. It seems to me that almost everything is a waste of time, he remarked one day as he walked dejectedly home from school. I can't see the point in learning to solve useless problems or subtracting turnips from turnips. And since no one bothered to explain otherwise, he regarded the process of seeking knowledge as the greatest waste of time of all. The overarching story is a very traditional story. It's about um, uh, a boy who goes through a portal to, into another world and is given, or is, is, you know, accepts his mission to save the princess, or princesses, and brings them back uh, and, and saves the day. And so as far as that goes, it's the traditional story of the, of the hero story. Um, but... The, the other level it's working on, um, which I think is the, the level that's really resonated, because that's kind of the frame that we hang up the story on, is this question about what's interesting and, and, and what, what's important. This kid meets one series of individuals, and each one of them is logical in their own world but doesn't make sense. And he's trying to make sense of things. Um, and to some extent, that's what his mission is, is to bring back rhyme and reason. So... What I think it is, is probably why it's called the Phantom Tollbooth, is because he gets a tollbooth, and then he... He hasn't read the book, so he has no clue what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, I listen, but it's just a little hard to explain. Um, so you want, you want me to go into more detail? Ooh. Oh. <laughs> okay. It's, it's so intricate, that's part of the issue, but... I think it's a tremendously hard book to summarize. I'm trying to think of how to explain it because it's so, like, confusing. I could do, like, the two-sentence, like... A Twitter. <laughs> the Twitter version. Okay, the hero of the story is a boy named Milo. Who has no idea what to do with himself. He starts out very disengaged and bored. It's so boring. It's a lot. <laughs> should have a song like that. He's just bored. He always looks down at his feet. And the way he's drawn by Jules as well makes him in that sweater. He looks like sort of existential man or existential eight-year-old or whatever, however old he's supposed to be. He gets home one day and he finds a sort of do-it-yourself toll booth kit, I guess. <laughs> um, and then he makes it and he happens to have a handy electric car. And so he gets in and he drives through the toll booth through this really weird world where letters had different tastes and where bugs talked. And the first place they get to is a place called Expectations. And this was a place that I always remember my parents and my parents' friends always talked about their children in terms of their expectations. So in my mind, Expectations was the place you had to go to first before you went anywhere else. First he goes to expectations, and then he goes beyond expectations to the doldrums. Ordinance 175389J. It shall be unlawful, illegal, and unethical to think, think of thinking, surmise, presume, reason, meditate, or speculate while in the doldrums. Anyone breaking this law shall be severely punished, he says. And he says, well, that's a ridiculous law, said Milo quite indignantly. Everybody thinks. We don't, shouted the lethargerians all at once. And most of the time, you don't said a yellow one, sitting in a daffodil. That's why you're here. You weren't thinking, and you weren't paying attention, either. People who don't pay attention often get stuck in the doldrums. And with that, he toppled out of the flower and fell snoring into the grass. <laughs> and he meets talk somewhere along this route. A sort of large, overstuffed dog with a clock embedded in its side. He has a clock. He's he has a, a watchdog, Max. A lot. Uh, there are things that are watch. I know there's there's dogs there's dogs, dogs, dogs that like watch, and then there's a watch and a dog, so that makes it a watchdog. <laughs> yeah, that's really playing with words. I have to say. And then travels through the foothills of confusion. Eventually reaches Dictionopolis. It's sort of the land of words. It's a whole city where everybody loves words. 
They just can't get enough of words, and there's the word market. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the word market. market. We'll take our vehicle. Conveyance. Rig. Charabank. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I thought that was kind of funny. Chariot. Buggy. Coach. Program. Um, oh, sorry. Shandrite. <laughs> I don't know. I, f- I find this funny because whenever I know something, Jack's always like, duh, it means this, and then, and then... We're venturing he, further like, and further into the realms of unknown words. And, and then he's like, cherubunk. <laughs> I, I, I have it all planned out in my head how I was going to pronounce that, but <laughs> for some reason it sounded better in my head than it does in real life. <laughs> cherubunk. <laughs> <laughs> There's this delight in uh, in the Phantom Toll booth with with words and numbers that there are things that you can play with. There's this one great word I can't remember. What he says uh, he wants to buy these words and he and I can't remember what the words are. But he says he didn't know what they meant, but they would seem pretty interesting, and he was sure that they were going to be great words. Lewis Carroll's Alice books are the best analogy to the Phantom Toll booth because they're books about written by people of first-rate minds, that it's about the process of learning. Alice gets educated in the course of the Alice books. She gets a very eccentric education at the hands of very crazy people, but she learns to rely on her own common sense. And that's what happens to Milo in the course of the book. He learns about uh, words. He learns about the power of words because he's in a universe in which words don't just have symbolic power, but they have actual power. If something's on the tip of your tongue, uh, you can take it uh, and, and travel with it and set a cannon off with it. So this character, who basically was me, Milo, he starts in the book and in the story as being very passive. I mean, things are just happening to him. Boredom, I think, is not only a terrible thing, but in many ways it's a kind of essential thing. You try to escape from boredom, and that's where many things happen in your head and your psyche. What the toll booth does is it, it takes you on an adventure to another world where you see the world in a different way. You see possibilities in a different way. It's really a quest for him to begin understanding that all of these things had to be paid attention to. So learning became very important, and becoming active in that learning also became very important. That is the journey. The only way to learn anything And the books that teach us that is to, in a sense, get on the road, go out on the road. Why did Jack Kerouac go? I mean, why so many road books and road movies and road this? Because the road means freedom. The road means the education you didn't get in school. The education you get in school is about approved information and control. The education you get on the road is the anarchy that comes out of living a real life and discovering what you really believe and your real values which comes as a shock. When I lived in the Bronx, which was a very tight, structured community, I was terrified of going anywhere or traveling anywhere because although I hated the Bronx and hated my life there, I took it for granted that I'd be killed if I left the neighborhood, that out there was simply death. And then against my will, really, I talked myself, made myself, hitchhike to California and back, knowing that I would die. Just, you know, assuming that I was going to get killed, but that I couldn't go on living in the Bronx, afraid of my shadow, and I had to break out somehow. And it might be better to die than live this way. And once I broke out, like Milo going on this trip, I found that my fears were much more dangerous to me than the real world, which turned out to be sweet and marvelous and interesting and full of events and full of adventure and then I increasingly was capable of handling myself and was resourceful of getting out of tight spots and all the things I didn't think I could do, I did. What the Toll Booth does for a generation of older readers who look back on it fondly, it in a sense was an early form of license for them. It told them that they could be free. There's so many 
uh, reasons I uh, um, identified with the book. I and mean, one is uh, my dad. My dad uh, and Norton share a very similar sense of humor, sadly. Um, <laughs> you know, love of puns uh, and uh, double entendres and very dry and a little bit insane. I'd, I would walk into the room and my father would say, aha, I see you're coming early since lately. You used to be behind before, but now you're first at last. And I would stand there absolutely befuddled. I didn't know what he was talking about. And then he'd come up to me and put his arm around me very solicitously and he'd say, you're a good kid and I'd like to see you get ahead. You need one. There were files of um, lists that Norton had compiled while he was working on the Phantom Tollbooth, like a list of 100 idioms, 50 synonyms. And it was as if um, he had his own sort of reference book of things that everybody has access to and use these as the raw materials for generating you know, the, the really hilarious uh, dialogue. And sometimes even entire characters came out of a turn of phrase. Two things I think are true, if I can be belligerent for a moment. One is, is that almost all the children's classics to a first approximation were written by authors whose specialty was not writing for children. That's certainly true about Lewis Carroll. It's true about C.S. Lewis. It's true about, uh, it's certainly true about Norton Juster, that he didn't set out to be a children's book author. Um, so I think that inevitably the content of the book will depend on the degree to which you're able to get your own uh, obsessive sort of grown-up material into it. Somebody upstairs said, Norton, you will write this. It was not in response to some child, the, ch the children out, you know, quote unquote, out there that, uh, that, he, that he wanted to uh, satisfy. I know this from myself, uh, you know. Uh, I truly don't think of the children. I, it's something that interests me, and this is true of Norton, too. And there must be something with Norton that, you know, clicked with him. There's something that he had to deal with through his work. I always did very poorly in math. I had something I discovered years later, which was called synesthesia. I couldn't do math without colors. And uh, it took me years, really, to get past that. Uh, I, every time, even a simple arithmetic problem, addition, subtraction, I would have to give uh, colors to the numbers. My daughter and my granddaughter had learning disabilities, and I remember with my daughter, we realized after a while that she was not going to get this, the, what she needed in the, in the public school. Their, almost their idea, at least in many cases, was, okay, you have a problem here. The answer to that problem you work harder. Or there's a stone wall there, and the answer to the question was, okay, you go up to it, and you gotta pound a hole with your head through it, rather than go around it or use a different method. It was the same situation with Tori. Um, I myself, learning dis disability in school, struggled in school, and finally, you know, dealt with it and kept going. I remember I was always hassled from like, my first year at White Oak till who knows when I was going to be hassled all the time to read it and go, Grandpa, I don't think I can read this yet. You know, with my learning disability, I wasn't able to actually sit down and read it because I would sit there and I would struggle on a word for so long and I'd get so mad and I'd just give up. And then last year I had an amazing tutorial teacher. She well, we sat down in tutorial and we read the book and I'd come home and I'd ask my grandpa, Grandpa, what did you mean when you said this in the book? And he'd always tell me, what, what do I think it means? The thing that's so vivid in my mind when I was a kid was that I'd get something to read, I'd take it home, I'd read it, I'd figure out what I thought it was all about. I'd come back into class very proudly and explain it to the teacher of the class when I was called on. And then the teacher would tell me how wrong I was, and she would tell me what the book or the story was all about. But it wasn't what it was all about for me. It was all about that that's how we teach that particular book. I must have had, um, and still have, some rather mild form of dyslexia. In high school, when there was a, a conversation in the class, Whatever it was I had to bring up was treated as if I hadn't said anything at all. 
or was dismissed as unresponsive. But it was I who was not being responded to. I just said things that one that weren't official, officially part of the official discussion going on in the room, and that had all borders, all, everything was bordered and boundaried. And you had to stay within those borders and boundaries to get a grade and also to be acknowledged as smart or interesting by the teacher. Nothing I had to say fit that prescription. And depending on one's own interest and sensitivity, it, you either accept it and take it for granted and are blasé about it, or as in my case, it drives you nuts. So it always drove me nuts. As far as my part of the book goes, what year are we talking about, Six, 59? 59, I yeah. think. Well, you know, I've been at The Voice for three years, and I had developed, finally, with some difficulty, a style. But clearly, that was not going to be the style of this children's book. What are the, the cogent, the core characteristics of a great Pfeiffer cartoon? They're acerbic, very New York, highly observant, belligerent almost in their, in their satirical attack, and Jules Pfeiffer is all of those things. I was going into uncharted territory and never having illustrated a children's book and having the ghost of Sendak, a friend, looming over me, the son of a bitch. Uh, I was scared silly. And um, because Maurice was the be-all and end-all of children's illustration, and I certainly felt that way. I mean, I did it because Norton wrote it, but I was not interested. I mean, this was the Cold War 50s. I was interested in overthrowing the government. Jules, you know, likes to joke that his mission was to bring down the American government uh, through his comic strips. And um, so really, um, though he kind of um, backed his way into um, the Phantom Toll Booth as its illustrator through his friendship with Norton. It was a project that on, on a basic level was very much uh, in tune with what he was already doing. The Cold War suffused everything that was going on at the time. And, uh, and in a way, uh, this might be a stretch, but it was the effect of Cold War, Cold War language that might have sneaked itself into some of the dialogue in the Phantom Tollbooth, some of the lugubrious explanations where words mean something else, where um, what one says uh, at one time means the opposite, and because that was public and even private address during the Cold War years. I mean, if you think of the two cities that Norton describes in the book, Dictionopolis is a place where words are bought and sold. And it could be thought of as a metaphor for New York at that, in the middle of the um, 20th century, the, the time of Mad Men. I mean, in Dictionopolis, the characters are great at generating sentence after sentence uh, of, of language, but they don't really care what the meaning behind their words really is. I think Norton you know, wanted to call that out for young people and to get them to think about what language is good for uh, which is for actually connecting with other people and forming a community. Tell about when you, the, at your 50th birthday, the present, his present for you. Tell me. Eric, I think we had a big party, and I believe it was the 50th birthday, but, and Norton gave Eric a little, a, from a dollhouse, a little oh, yeah. couch. And on it, he placed an insect, I think a very green, violent green. Plastic, rubbery. Rubbery grasshopper. And then he wrote a letter to Eric about what a shame it was that this man had made a fortune with neurotic insects. Sex. Yeah. And, and the P.S. of the letter is, my five-year-old daughter draws better pictures than you do. <laughs> no, that's Norton. I'd like to put a stop to one rumor that Jules has been spreading, that the only reason he did the illustrations was I threatened not to feed him. I did the cooking for the three of us. Yes, you did. Yeah. Marvelous meals we had. Yes, he was a very good cook. I never threatened to withhold food from him. No, I just didn't eat for several days and when I didn't <laughs> hadn't done a drawing. I, I picked up the message. <laughs> but he was a one, he loved food. Um, and this is before food was in, you know, I mean, this is... Well, this don't is, talk in the past tense. You know, Americans didn't eat at that time. Uh, 
I mean, what we did was feed our face. It was before we discovered food. Okay, what I'm about to do <laughs> is fry up this eggplant, egg, breaded eggplant. Then I'm going to consol consolidate them into these two uh, frying pans, put on some uh, mozzarella cheese and sauce on some of them, and on some of them there's going to be mozzarella cheese, prosciutto, and sauce for uh, those people who like meat. Okay, are we ready? I remember one morning he made breakfast for me and three, four of my friends. He comes in and he says, do you know what this is? And we all kind of went, hmm, no, but it's very good. <laughs> and then he says, well, it's Scrapple. Do you know what's in Scrapple? No, we all say, well, it's pig's noses and pig's snouts and... Yeah, you know, yeah. I can't remember what else. One of my friends chimes in and says, "Do they clean the snouts?" No. And my dad says, "No, that's what gives it the flavor." All three or four of the forks dropped, and that was it. We I don't even think they ever touched scrapple again. This is much too small and too ladylike. I'm not gonna wear this thing. Yeah, you know I taste great. Yeah, you know I taste great. At the Harvest Grease Ball. You know what you could do? Take each of these pieces out and fold them in half like that. If you would. I could do that. Justin Hall? Well, you can do it five eighths and three eighths if you like. Here at the shop. Oh, yes. Thank you. What about my pepper? Enjoy. Bon appetit. Thank you. And would you like a penis? Okay. Um, <laughs> where were we? Do you remember when you first met Jules? Now that you, now that you bring it up, it was in Brooklyn Heights. Fifty, fifty million years ago. I remember he had a, he had a huge room. I don't know how he got it, and uh, and messy with stuff all over the floor. And I hadn't met Norton until I ran across Jules' wife on Columbus, on Columbus Avenue. You know all that story. It was only because we got to the wrong editor. Uh, Judy got it to at Jason Epstein, who wasn't a children's editor. No. Which I think is the only reason it got published. Judy, my wife then, gave it to Jason to look at, to read, to make a suggestion. And he said, well, I'm starting Looking Glass Library. And... I love this, and you know, he loved language, and I want to do this. Now, nobody else, I think no conventional children's book editor would have ever bought this book. If he'd gone to an agent, I would never have. The last person they would send it to would be me. It might have been difficult. It, it might have had a problem, though, because it, it, it didn't conform to whatever the crazy rules were at the time for children's books. Phantom Tollbooth was published in 1961. Four years earlier, um, The Cat in the Hat had been published and designed specifically to make learning to read a fun experience. The fear was that American children didn't read as well as the Russians and that we were falling behind in the Cold War. And reading was one of the key um, you know, uh, skills that uh, children, American children would need to, um, to, to keep up. Um, and to, to, to make it uh, work for children, The Cat in the Head was written from a controlled vocabulary, a list of a couple of hundred words that children of seven or eight could be expected to easily recognize. The idea was to make it easy for them so they wouldn't be frustrated. Um, this idea wasn't carried over to every children's book of the time, but it was definitely in the air. And it was um, such that um, a book like The Phantom Tollbooth, which basically mines the entire dictionary for for words and finds clever ways of incorporating them into the story, um, could very well have been uh, a target by some people who would say, um, you know, children of 10 or 11 uh, would find this book too challenging, too difficult. 
before it really got out, the word that I was getting from everybody, and I didn't know any better because that's the first thing I'd ever done, and I was told by a number of people in publishing that number one, it wasn't a children's book. Number two, uh, the vocabulary was much too difficult. And the killer, of course, was the last one, which was that fantasy was bad for children because it disoriented them. I suddenly said, what have I done? This is crazy. The book is going to come out. It's going to go right, right into the basement of some bookstore. And that's the last time anybody would see it. And the salespeople put very few copies out because it was a brand new book. No one ever heard of it. And it wasn't the kind of thing that librarians would go for. It didn't, it didn't follow the rules, whatever the rules were. In those days, the woman who made those decisions within the York library system was named Miss, Miss Chimino. She might have had her first name, but no one was ever allowed to use it. And she was, she was full of authority, and she made all the very important decisions whether the library system here would take the book or not. And I had many conversations with her, all of them futile and confusing. And in those days, Martha's Vineyard had a, a, a bohemian aspect. A lot of, um, sort of 20s radicals were living up there. And I was publishing a book by uh, one of them, and I went up to visit him about that, and he said, let's go to the beach. And I was, I, in those days, I wore neckties and all that stuff. And I went down to the beach just dressed like that, but it turned out to be a nudist beach. And I was sitting down uh, politely on, the, on a blanket or something, and I turned my head, and there was a woman, and you can imagine what part of her I noticed right away, and who was it but Miss Chimino? <laughs> <laughs> Miss Chimino, I said. <laughs> well, that's my, that's my story about children's book publishing. Incredible turnout. Yeah. yeah. I think that went well. Either when we've spoken in colleges, as we have from time to time, Hiya. what do books to our parents is, you see, and this is quite moving, something like two to three generations of readers, fans, who will come up and say, this, is, this book changed my life. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Love the book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, look at this tattoo. Look at that. Wow. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> is that where I got the idea? You know, you can get a tattoo, you gotta think about, you know, what am I gonna put on my body that's gonna be there until I die? That is representative of who you are. Uh, all those important questions you ask when you're getting a tattoo, or you should ask when you're getting a tattoo. Uh, and so in coming to that conclusion, um, yeah, that was a very clear one. Don't you remember this? This is the one you signed in 1960. Really? Yeah. My signature hasn't gotten any better. <laughs> 50 years is a big number. But it doesn't count so much if you're talking about the length of history of the world. But it means a hell of a lot. If it's a piece out of your life, it's an appalling number. You realize that 50 years. <laughs> and uh, I was kind of curious about it. And I knew, as I said, that it was coming. And I was pleased because I guess, I guess I can say I was proud of the fact that the book had lasted that long. Because there are many things in that book that we talk about or I talk about or you might ask me about that I had no idea about when I was writing it. There were things just coming from a, a very small piece of time in my life. Uh, but what I was pleased about and proud about was the fact that in some ways it manages to touch a lot of universal concerns for children. You know, the last thing in the world Morton wanted to do as a writer, still the last thing he wants to do and the very thing that I don't ever want to do is um, set out to teach a lesson in the work I do. If something comes through that, if a kid picks up a message through that, that's simply the story you're telling and he or she is picking it up um, because you're representing who and what you are on paper and that gets through. And when I started writing for children, I tried to do exactly the same thing, represent the kids, because children's literature, I mean, books, um, not just kids' books, but the novels I read as a kid were lifesavers and life changers because they were the friends that I didn't have. That's what, that's what books are, thank God. 
and they all contribute something to the, whatever sense you can make of the world, which isn't much. As I try to say, show throughout the book even, that a child's world is different in the sense that the children perceive things without the same limits, without the same influences. And I think we lose something important if we eliminate that, if we become an adult without, without taking with us that, that sense of to digress into things like that. <laughs> you know we recorded that. What? Well, you can have my <laughs> any time. Gene, what do you think about that? About your husband's behavior? When? Any time. Any time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's quite m tame now compared to what it used to be. Norton has boxes of notes on ideas for things. Three lifetimes full. <laughs> so we, we'll, he'd probably have to live to be like 200 or something. Yeah in order to get a, even a fraction I'm planning of to do that, actually. I told my ambition, simply, is to live long enough to be a burden on everyone. I don't, I don't want to be 30 or 40 or even 50, but I wouldn't mind 60 again. Yeah, I'm... I'm because it, you, do, you do start thinking about, um, you know, you're 80, how much longer are you going to live? Yeah, I'm 82 now, and I can still remember how nice it was at 81. <laughs> you may. What? You may uh, not remember next year. But um, but nobody thinks Norton is 82. He's He doesn't seem 82, do you? Do you feel 82? Uh, <laughs> yes. It's hard to pin it down that close, you know. <laughs> no. I know I'm too old to be Rookie of the Year. <laughs> That's the important thing. That's yeah. where you really feel it. I'm living in Southampton. I have a little house and my drawing table and, and the, a king-size bed and a 63-inch size television. Oh, and a dog and a cat and a girlfriend. But I can't find any of them. The cats are very good at hiding. Oh, Daisy, there you are. Working, well, I don't have any choice. <laughs> I don't have any money. Oh, really? No. No, I knew how to get famous, but never rich. I, that, part, that part got left out of the mix. Well, it's because you chose not to sell out. Well, I mean, that's, yeah. I, it's, uh, now I'm willing to sell out, but it's too late. Nobody's interested. <laughs> the only nostalgia I have is for the moment. I love the time I'm in. I love my life out here, which is connected to the, the to the college, where I'm. I, I feel a part of an, an arts program that, like me, feels supportive of young people and students, and wants them and gives them a license to try things and do things and fall on their face, and make mistakes without judging them and prejudging them and making them aware of the margins and making them aware of the do's and don'ts. That that. Uh, that make them aware instead that failure is a process and you have to fail over and over and over again to get at anything that's worthwhile. I once tried to explain to a kid who asked me, and it was a, it was a middle school uh, appearance I was making, and at some point we were talking about this very issue of what is, what is it that is important to learn, what is learning, and I tried to figure out a way. It was a very earnest question from a young man who, what was he, in fifth or sixth grade? What does that make him, 12 or something like that? And I said, well, think of it this way. Your whole life you are receiving, especially your younger life, you're receiving information from everywhere. Your own eyes, your own ears, everything is in the service of, of gaining information. And if you picture it this way, each piece of, of, of information or each so-called fact you take and you put somewhere in the air. And they're all, then they're all independent. None of them has anything to do with any other kind of fact. And you begin to gain, and there are enormous numbers of them. And one day you say to yourself suddenly, okay, this one over here seems to connect with that one. And this one here connects with this one. And this one connects to three other places. And finally, after a long while, you find out that it's not the facts that are very important. It's all the connections you have made 
with those pieces of information that you use and allow you to think about the world, problems, ideas in a way very different than you could have before. I think the Phantom Tollbooth makes a beautiful, completely unpretentious, utterly charming, magical case for the value of learning. That's what the book is about. It says if you master the worlds of numbers and letters, you will be, as Milo says at the end of the book, I, he's nowhere he wants to go to because he has the whole universe right there in his room. Do you know Keats's, Keats's letter in which he uses the term negative capability? To remain in doubt, mysteries, and uncertainties without any irritable search after fact or reason. Don't look for answers. They're only questions. And that's what characterizes that book for children. There are no final answers. Milo walked sadly to the window and squeezed himself into one corner of the large armchair. He felt very lonely and desolate as his thoughts turned far away to the comforting assurance of Toc standing next to him, to rhyme and reason without whom wisdom withered, and to the many others he would always remember. And yet, even as he thought of all these things, he noticed somehow that the sky was a lovely shade of blue. Outside the window, there was so much to see and hear and touch, walks to take, and in the very room in which he sat, there were books that could take you anywhere, things to invent and make and build and break, and all the puzzle and excitement of everything he didn't know. Music to play, songs to sing, and worlds to imagine, and then someday make real. Well, I would like to take another trip, he said, jumping to his feet, but I really don't know when I'll have the time. There's just so much to do right here. All the distance I have traveled All the miles along the road Every second that is passing Shows me something I don't know There's a music in what happens There's a reason and a rhyme I just try to pay attention Keep my eyes open wide How long had I been drifting how long had I been asleep? How long had I not noticed the world in front of me? There's a music in what happens. There's a reason and a rhyme. I just try to pay attention, keep my eyes open wide keep my eyes open wide there are words and there are numbers they say don't get the two It's either one or the other You can't have both You got to choose but There's a music in what happens There's a reason and a rhyme I just try to pay attention And keep my heart open wide I'll keep my heart open wide 
open wide, 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 wide.